Gareth Evans, how's it going, mate? Yeah, doing okay. I mean, all things considered, we're doing all right. You are one of the best action directors, period. When it comes to action movies, at this current time, you'd be hard-pressed to find anyone better. <laughs> it's amazing what you've done. But what really boggles my mind is, like, did you do martial arts as a kid? Where does that interest that's so prevalent in martial arts come from with you? I, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to. Like, I, I grew up you know, as a kid, like not watching and not reading sort of comic books of superheroes. But I mean, I, 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 I've said it a couple of times in the past, but it's like when I first saw Bruce Lee in Enter the Dragon, which is probably the first time I'd ever seen martial arts in, on, on screen. Same here, same here. It, it was just, it was a revelation, wasn't it? And it was just that thing of, you feel like you're watching an actual superhero, but you know, flesh and blood, no cape, no gimmicks, just pure physicality and what he was able to achieve. And and that, that to me was like, you know, he was like godlike almost, you know? And he, oh, God, yeah, yeah. And, and so... And mean that, in that film. Yeah, I know. Well, that, that, that was intense and mean. That was one of the things with Bruce, though, I think across all of his films. I know, like, he started playing around with the humor a little bit more in Way of the Dragon. But, um, yeah. you know, in terms of his, his character in The Big Boss and Fist of Fury and, and Enter the Dragon, I mean, he was mean. <laughs> I mean, there was, it was about rage and about aggression and about anger, about... Exactly. Um, a uh, hunger for revenge, but then also about the, like, you know, not to be too cheesy on it, but like the fury inside himself. And, you know, every yeah. time you kill someone, you'd feel it all etched in his face. It was anguish. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, sorry, I could go off on a tangent there. Yeah, we, we can go off on Bruce. Yeah, it's unavoidable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and so that was my first introduction to martial arts properly, you know, as, as a child and realizing, oh, this is the thing. And, um, you know, I think as in most kids in the 80s growing up in the UK, you know, especially I, I was in a small community. So the only thing I had access to was like, oh, there was a there was a karate lessons down the road in, in yeah. the sort of local gym. Right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I, I went there and joined the joined the sessions there on the weekend on the weeknight. Sorry. And I did it for a little while. But. I was the one running around the dojo thinking he was going to be Jackie Chan trying to do flying kicks and stuff like that when we were doing sparring sessions, not realizing there's an actual form and a sort of discipline to this. So I was, you know, not in a cocky way, but just in a sort of... to fight, Gareth, not entertain people. <laughs> exactly. I wanted to do the flips and things that I'd seen Jackie yeah. Chan doing, right? So, You're not the so only got... one. You're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was one of those things where, because I used to go with my brother and he would go and do the karate lessons as well. Once he stopped, because my brother was more interested in football and, and tennis and rugby and other sort of sports, that was when I sort of stopped going then. I looked up to my brother, I followed him a lot. And so when I didn't have somebody to go with, I was quite a shy kid when I was growing up. So that shyness then was like, I, I don't want to go into that room if I haven't got my brother with me. And so I kind of drifted out of martial arts in terms of practicing it. And yeah. then I became obviously completely obsessed with the idea of watching it. Um, my dad was the one responsible for getting me into it in the first place because, you know, every Saturday, every other Saturday would be a trip to the video shop. Um, on the way to go watch the rugby it, it would be a combination of like lots of different films like you'd obviously go for like american sort of commercial films and you know blockbusters and stuff like that but then every now and then we would add to the pile something unusual something unique something different and you know my dad was a big fan of cinema so he followed world cinema a lot you know he was i remember him raving about nikita before i was too before i was old enough to actually sit down and watch it so there was always like you know films from other countries coming into the house and um, and he he's the one that brought Armor of God into the house, and then that was sort of like the introduction to Jackie Chan, and got me obsessed with all of that. Hey, I remember it, and I'm sure it was the same for you because we're in the same country, yeah. pretty much. Um, uh, all the Jackie Chan films started coming out at the same time. It's like there was Van Damme, and the way my, my memory is terrible, but I remember Jackie Chan film coming out, and it seemed like every month there was a new one in the video. Mm -hmm. Am I remembering that right? Um, my, my difficulty was my video shop was sort of like, we had like two small video shops in a very small sort of like, you know, town community. It's very you know, village, not even a town, right? Yeah. So for us, it was like, it, it was, I think for me, when I realized that Armor of God existed, it was suddenly like, oh, there are all these other films with that guy in. Mm. You know, so the, I, I can't remember it being sort of our oh, one came out and then the other came out and then the other came out. I think later on, yes. But at the start, it was almost like, 
oh, wow, there's like five other films that I could be watching here. What's Wheels on Meals? What's Project A? What's, you know, Police Story and stuff yeah. like that. Actually, with Police Story, I didn't know that it was a Jackie Chan film at first because my, my dad had rented it. And back in those days, obviously, you used to get the, the, the box of the store, not the actual box of the film, right? I was quite despondent because my dad just brought the thing. And I was like, I don't want to watch some American film about police. I want to watch Jackie Chan. And he was like, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, we're watching this tonight. And he knew what he got. Okay. You know, but he didn't tell me. He didn't let on. Uh-huh. And then, you know, I remember popping the tape in and then it's starting up saying, you know, the Golden Harvest logo popping up. And I was like, oh, my God, this is a, this is a martial arts film. This is a martial arts film. Just being, you know, that was my association with Golden Harvest. They, they didn't make anything else other than just martial arts films to me yes. at that time. That opening and, crawl at the beginning. Oh, God. That meant it was martial arts film time. Yeah, it was, 100%. Yeah. And then it unfolded and I was just like obsessed with it. I remember watching that shopping center scene because I think we probably had it on a Saturday so we didn't have to take it back till a Monday. So that meant Sunday, I would just spend all Sunday, watch, rewind, watch, rewind, watch, rewind. Yeah. Just that last 15, 20 minutes the entire way through. When do you think the seed was planted in your head that you wanted to make films of that sort of nature? That was very late in the game, to be quite honest. That was sort of like um, the, the, the thing with do, making my own martial arts films probably didn't really become an idea in my head until Maranto, to be quite honest. It was like, it was like I, I just didn't think that Welsh people could go off and make martial arts films. It was not I a, didn't either. <laughs> there wasn't a precedent for it. And so, you know, uh, other than probably like Marcus Shakespeare, who's like, you know, being, you know the, the, the sort of the Welsh Well, he's Jackson, another anomaly. You know? Yeah, exactly. Really exactly. <laughs> I wanted to be like the European art house filmmaker type guy. That's what I thought it was going to be. That's where I thought my, my career was going to go, um, yeah. or at least try to do that. And yeah. so I was watching a lot of Japanese cinema, a lot of sort of extreme cinema, and I was kind of like veering down that path a little bit, you know, borrowing heavily from Kitano, Kim Kituk, and stuff like that, um, and Mike. And, um, and, and really kind of think, you know, I'm going to hone my craft in this. Then nothing happened for a while. And then I got hired to do a documentary out in Indonesia um, through, my, through my wife, who had like links to this production company back in Jakarta. And, um, and we went out there and we started making this documentary. And it was like, I, I had been, obviously I'd been a fan of martial arts films and I'd watched them a ton. But then suddenly uh, it never really occurred to me that it could really be a viable part of my life and my career. And then suddenly I'm in this other country learning a brand new martial art that I had not really properly seen before yeah. um, in, in CLAT and, and, and seeing these different styles, these different techniques, how adaptable it was and how interesting the movements were. I found like there's a certain energy and rhythm to it. It's quite circular in its movements sometimes, you know, with elbow strikes coming down low and going back high. And I just found it really visually interesting, I guess, in a way. And we met Eco through that documentary yeah. and we couldn't take our eyes off him. We just thought he had this screen presence about him. Yes. And, um, and so when I spent six months out there doing that documentary, it was kind of like a, a litmus test to be like, oh, can I live out here? Can I, can I actually base myself out here and, 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 and set up shop here? And I felt like I could. And so then we went back out there and then you know, after spending five, six months working for a TV company, hated my job. Um, I ended up, uh, you know, writing Maranto. So obviously you've, you've took in all this knowledge of martial arts films growing up watching them. When you thought, okay, I'm going to make a martial arts film now. Like, how did you figure out the best way to shoot it? Because I think instinctively you knew how to do it. Is that just from the knowledge of watching films? Um, combination of things. One, one was just when I knew I was going to go off and make Maranto, I, I did like, I did two, three, three things that, that were key to, you know, and I, I look back on Maranto and I'm still like, okay, I changed this bit. I changed that bit. I shoot this differently. I cut that differently. We all do. We all look back yeah. at it and, you know, find the, the flaws or wherever in what we do is, you know, we're human at the end of the day. And it's like, three things that kind of like set me up ready for doing something like Maranto was that uh, the first thing was uh, research. I just watched and watched and watched all the films I remember loving back then yeah. and analyzed them and, and really like try to watch, see 
what Jackie was doing with the camera, what Samo was doing with the camera, you know, and just learn from them and just like try to figure out why, why, why am I responding to certain types of martial arts in movies? Why am I responding to the presentation of it? Sorry. Um, in some films and not in others, what are the things that feel eggy? Um, and why am I feeling, why are they feeling eggy? Cause I'd never analyzed it before. I'd never sort of broken it down into its, yeah. into its elements before. And so I started, you know, picking away at those films, finding, shots and movement of camera that I that I, I really liked and responded to it was like it was the first time I kind of realized uh, watching something like the ending of Heart of Dragon for instance it was yeah. the first time that I realized when I was watching that because there was just something I loved about the rhythm of that sequence it was something I loved about the way Samo was shooting that sequence that I didn't really know what it was and then I started realizing you know what there's really good contra moves here with the action there's really good dolly yeah. shot movements in the well, he moves the camera action. brilliantly Samo oh, better than anyone I yeah. I'd argue in terms of martial arts stuff I think he's, he's, yeah. he's a genius you know so that was the first thing I did the second thing I did was um, I actually shot two sort of short test fight sequences with okay. good guys first all right the first one I did, which you is want to see before. these test fights. Come on. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> we, do. we, want to, we want to know how the legend began. <laughs> Ropey at the start. <laughs> so we did that. And then that was the first thing we shot. It was about six minutes odd, seven minutes odd. And it was like, it was like a group fight against Eco that then ended up climaxing with Eco fighting against Yayan. Um, and, and, you know, this was like the first, one of the first few times I'd met Yayan actually, I think on, on, on that pro, on that little short thing we did. Yeah. And then we did another one then, which was a little bit more, Okay, let's let's go down into the car park of the office and shoot the fight sequence where he goes to fight against um, Pat Edwell, who was um, a, a Silat Harimau instructor who give us the, who did the choreography, sorry, with the guys on Miranda on the first film, and we did a little sort of like short fight there where I play around a little bit more with my camera moves. I felt a bit more confident, you know, sort of starting to get to there, and so like those those two short films kind of like gave me an opportunity to to try the stuff. And to figure out some stuff and to, to, to uh, you know, scrutinize where I was going wrong um, and, and then try to kind of fix that progressively then as we were leading up towards what would have been the feature. Yeah. But I was still bricking them. I was still terrified and nervous. And so that the third thing then, and this is the most important thing, and this is the thing that you know, I've carried through all the way through everything I've done since and have never wanted to change that method is previous it's it's just like the most valuable tool I could imagine when it comes to action filmmaking. I just, I swear by it. I'll never do it any other way than, than, than the way I've been doing it since then. And it existed back then because it was a safety net because it was. And did you get the idea to do previs from anywhere else or did it just instinctively come to you as, okay, this would be a good idea. I, I want to say I must've seen something online, like you know, behind the scenes of something else yeah. being made where they might have well, shown some Seven Eleven became famous in Hollywood for doing these fight previews. Yeah. Um, and I would see a lot of them. And <laughs> until John Wick, the fight previews was always better than the, the final products in whatever movie they'd done it for. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but well, yeah, they became quite famous for that. Well, that was the thing. I mean, like, that, was, that would have been pre them being able to control the fate of the fight. Yeah, you know what I mean, and which yeah. is which is a major thing, you know what I mean, and and unless you have somebody, you know, uh, sat in the director's seat that actually respects the fight and respects the action design, yeah, it can go all sorts of different ways. Then you know, but go back to it. I mean, like, guys yeah. like Isaac, you know what I mean? Like, they, they, you know, he comes from a martial arts background. He understands the fight discipline. He understands the importance of yeah. shooting. But the fight we never properly. previewed it. We just we rehearsed the fight. Oh, really? We we never previewed it. No, we just we'd record it to remember it, so we didn't yeah. forget it. But then Isaac, on the day, would look at a section of the fight and say, okay, let's go from here to here, and I want to film it like this. Wow. That's, that's how we did it with Isaac, yeah. See, the, the, that, he, he's got that in his head that he knows exactly what he wants. Yes. I'm f awful for that, so I'm really bad at that. I, I always, I'm no, always you're like... No, you're doing it anyway, and you're doing it in the previous. Yes, uh, yeah. But I suppose it's very smart to have that safety net of, okay, I'm filming it in the gym, and we're going to try some different angles out. I'm going to cut it together. And then we're going to find what it is in the gym, which mm. I think is what you do. And then when yeah. you get onto set, you have the blueprint then, and you know exactly what to do, and you're not going to waste any time. No. This is what and we're we, going to do. We, and we, what we started doing now, like working with Jude on, on, on stuff, is what we've started doing, which is like, you know, to be honest, probably something I wish I'd done in Indonesia as well. It just makes much more sense. Is that we would always shoot like a sort of, like a, we call it like the Tai Chi speed version first. So like when we're doing these right. little fight sequences, like I'll figure 
go out my shots with the guys where I'm just like, oh, I'll just go like 30%, 40% oh, this okay. one and find the shot first. Because like, I don't want them to take like an accidental clatter or a bump or whatever. Yeah. You know, when you I'm still... When I'm still well. Exactly. When, yeah. I, so when I'm still figuring out the shot, like each shot one by one, I'm like, like 30%, 40% speed. I don't need it any faster than that. And I would just yeah. slow it down. And then I know then, okay, if there's like a punch coming from here, how can I best represent that? What can I do with the camera? How can I like, uh, uh, how can I figure out the best way to show the audience that piece of movement there? Yeah. And it allows me to get, you know, under the hood, so to speak. It allows me to scrutinize the action then and then be able to figure that's out. That's what Isaac would do as well, but he'd be doing it on the day. So that's halfway the thing. through a fight day and he's going, show me again, show me again. Okay, one more time, show me again. And I'm like, I'm absolutely knackered. Can <laughs> we just shoot it? <laughs> Amazing. So this fight sequence, um, Christ, I tell you what, this is such a long time ago. It's such a weird thing to kind of re to, to revisit. Oh, he just flew over the bar. <laughs> yeah. The, we were we were really, I remember us being really there, happy there, with... Following the, the beer bottle. That is a lo lovely little shot, just following the beer bottle as it goes in. I, I swear some of that stuff would have probably come from like uh, Sam or Jackie's work. Like it's the traditional thing of like, Sam does it a lot where he, he has these shots where you have the hero frame and then like a knife will come into frame. Like it'll jump in from the side and it'll fill the frame with it. And it's the, oh, this is the new threat. This is the new thing that you're introducing. And, and I, I'm guarantee it probably came from there. Um, you know, this, this whole sequence, man, we shot in this club. It was like such a sort of a small little space. Um, it wasn't like, wasn't the most conducive to filmmaking. Um, but I remember when Ico did his first sort of like uh, low kick and high kick to the face. I remember when we did it, the, the take that we ended up using he was so, so happy that we got um, the, 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 the blocking just right. Because, you know, it, like, like with all things, you never want to actually kick someone in the face and stuff like that. So just, just to get that, that we always, I always kept talking to him, oh, make sure it feels like a snap. Make sure when you hit it, it's got like a snap. And if, the, uh, if his timing and then the, the stunt performer's timing is exact, then it'll feel like a kick. It'll feel for real. I remember he was so excited and, and happy when we did playback on on that shot in particular because we were like, "Oh, it looks really good," and, and this would have been this would have been early in the production as well when we did right, that yeah. nightclub scene. Can I just say that the bit where he throws the guy and he does half a spin and then he front kicks him across the table, we completely ripped that off for Undisputed Three. Ah, uh -huh, nice. <laughs> three with the, one of the security guards, Larnella, and uh, I think it was my idea to rip you off, but Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah. Did you think to yourself at any point, I've made a mistake giving him a blue shirt because now as soon as the fight starts, he's going to be absolutely saturated in sweat. Mate, the worst thing was letting him grow his hair. Was, was, was asking him to grow his hair because it was like one of those things where Eco's hair when it was long back then would only look good when it was soaking wet with sweat because um, um, uh, <laughs> it would just dry up and just puff up. And, um, and so we That's were always... Mind, got something in common there. <laughs> <laughs> Now talk to me about dropping the stuff that you actually shoot into the previs as you do it because I never heard of anyone do that until you said it. It makes perfect sense. I have not been able to do that on my movies because the dip guy is always like, I oh, know I need I need time to get it. Right. I don't this understand is... the technological side of things, but it's ne we can't do that. Yeah, well, if this is always where I, I have to give a tip of the hat to Danu, my, my dit guy from Indonesia, because he set up the network system for me and spoiled me rotten in, in right. Indonesia when we did the raid two. And I've brought Danu over since then for everything I've done. So like he's worked on, you worked on Apostle, you worked on gangs and the system that he puts in place is brilliant where literally, you know, my lap, well, his laptop is sitting there on set nearby the monitors. It's connected to a network cable or with a Wi-Fi signal. Um, and basically, uh, while we're shooting every shot of that action sequence, um, my edit is sat on there. And so when, I, when, when, it, when it sits on the, the, the thing there, as soon as I call cut on anything, um, obviously Daniel's team then are sending that file across to me over a LAN network. And so by the time I'm kind of ready to sort of sit down at the laptop and, and try to drop that shot in, it's usually sat there on the hard drive. Or if not, I'm waiting like maybe 30 seconds. That's it. Um, we always have a sort of like a joke around about the fact that we used to joke around about um, uh, how quickly can you get a file to me? 
you know, can you, can you get it to me before I'm stood at the laptop? You know, and all that. Like, this kind of like a back and forth. It keeps everyone on their toes a little bit, you know, uh, in, in a fun way. And, and so, yeah, so I, I'll cut that in then. So, so while... Let's give you immediate peace of mind. Oh, yeah. 100%. I mean, even though you've just shot it and you know it works, but to see how it relates to the previous shot that you just did, and you have the previous anyway, so you're going to see how then it links on to the next part. Yeah. And, and, and then also, it's like, well, that's, that's the beauty of it, because you can see, you know, are the shots working? Because there's so many different parameters and so many variables that could change differently on a take, whether it's a slight repo of the camera that's you know, not quite right, or whether, you know, the performance takes a little longer, or whether there's something that the actor's done, which is different, but I prefer it. You know what I mean? So if there's something that's like that within, within, the, within the shot, then... Or a I might I, where somebody gets hit in the face and you want to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or a movement or an evasion. Let's do that. Yeah, <laughs> and, then, okay. um, and basically when you get something like that, that just, just works, right? But it might not cut into the next shot or it, it might need another shot to add. I know I need that shot. I know it right there in that moment. I'm not, I'm not sort of like, you know, three days later, we've left the set and be like, oh, I wish we could go back and get that insert. Or can we add that to the schedule, please? You know, can we find some way, some way of doing that into it? I was like, no, I'm, I'm good. I know exactly what I need as we're shooting it. And so I can make those decisions there and then in that moment. Um, and, and, and yeah, it is peace of mind as well because I can see it coming together. I can see it formulated. But also on top of that, um, you know, it's great for the cast and the crew because um, I'm not like precious. I'm not sort of like, this is my monitor and, and no one's allowed to see it. Yeah. Like when I cut the stuff and then like at the end of every day, we might have like a 40, 50 second sequence and it's already put together. That's already edited together. Cause I've done my little frame cuts here and there, little speed ramps or whatever I need to do um, just to make sure I got it. And then I, I've gone through that process. So like when, when people are having lunch, I might, you know, <laughs> quickly scoff down some food so I can just do 10, 15 minutes of tweaking and, 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 and tightening on the cut. And then at the end of the day, then if anyone wants to come and look at the monitor, even though most of them want to go home, <laughs> some of them will want to crowd around and just take a look at what they did that day and, and see it there and then and be able to be and like, oh, shit, we achieved them, something. It? Oh, yeah, totally. It's a it real morale. Money. It's very hard, isn't it, Make, making fights? Physically very taxing, you know. Yeah. It gets to the point where you're just like, can this just be over and done with? And do you really need another take? Can we just live with that one? Mm -hmm. But I guess if you're seeing that and it's really working, then you get very energized by that. Well, the thing, most people fall into the trap of shooting action the, the Hollywood way. I mean, if you went to Hollywood school, they would say, shoot the master, shoot the coverage, we'll edit it all together. No. Um, I mean, how did you know to not do it that way? It's just um, an instinctive thing. Because I have to say this, to be honest, I used to make my own little home movies when I was a kid, knowing nothing about filmmaking or, or how they did it. Mm. And I instinctively did it the Hong Kong way because that's just what made sense. I'm going to shoot this bit. Oh, yeah. and then there's an edit there. So then we'll get this angle and then we'll get this angle. So was yeah, it the thing? I think so. I think because I knew I was going to edit the thing myself, there's that weird internal logic then, which tells you where you would put your cuts. Mm. And so I never, ever entertained the idea that we would do any kind of masters for anything in terms of fight sequences. You know yeah. what I mean? I, 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 to this day, I hate shooting wide masters of drama scenes, even, you know, never mind action sequences. I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate wasting, you know, the, the time that you spend on, on going through two or three takes or something on a massive wide when really I know already in my head kind of how I want that scene to play out and how I want to kind of cut to it, where the emotion is. So I hate, I hate doing those wide masters. Everyone kind of keeps saying, oh, don't you think you're going to need it? And they are right. I do end up needing it from like, you know, for, from an editorial uh, standpoint. The beginning like, of it and the end. In and out of. Yeah, yeah, the beginning and the very end. Yeah. But that's the thing. And it's like, you know, so when it came to action, it was almost like, no, no, no I don't need this. Because there's no one shot that's going to sustain you for the entire sequence. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if it's acting, it's a good idea to maybe warm up the performers, do a nice wide, you know, take, if you forget your lines, keep going. Let's, let's all yeah, understand yeah. what the scene is. Uh, but if it's action, yeah. uh, you can serve people's energy. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it just, yeah. it just helps. I think it really helps. I think people, I think uh, performers prefer shooting like that, I think, <laughs> as opposed to doing the long takes of, oh, you know, well, have we really though, got it or not? Me, you know? it, it, it's insanely frustrating knowing that I'm doing a lot of stuff that's going to end up on the 
editing room floor. And for me to be doing a movie where I know it's all been shot wrong, mm -hmm. very frustrating. And if it's a film that I'm starring in, I, I won't let that happen. I mean, I have yeah. done it in the past a little bit, not now, but if it's a bigger movie, I've probably got a smaller role and I just have to bite my lip and go, this is gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a really interesting shot. Yeah, this was, um, I always knew I wanted this shot. We, we spent a, a while getting this one in because it was, um, and this is probably like the first time I played with the idea of you know, knowing that I could rotate the camera quite so smoothly. Because you know, I came from background of doing, like before this, I'd only done super low budget independent stuff. Um, and so suddenly it's like, oh, wait, there's a, it was that thing of like the idea of like the jib was sort of, um, was quite complicated. And the fact that it allowed that kind of camera movement it was my first experience of doing that. So when it comes to some of the older stuff I've done, um, you know, some of that stuff like with Maranto, I was very naive. I was very new to the process. So I remember, you know, jumping onto that shoot thinking, oh, we'll blitz through this. It'll be really quick. It'll be just like when I did like footsteps, which was, you know, five members of crew. So when we did Maranto, suddenly it's like a hundred plus people. And, and I have, I really was so green and so naive throughout that entire process. I mean, I used to go up to Matt all the time and be like, oh, um, can you get me this angle, please? And then, you know, he'd go up and then sort that out. And then I'd be looking at the camera to kind of make a mental note of what the lens number was. Like, oh, so that's, okay, so that's an 85. Okay, oh, so, oh this is 65, yeah. oh, this is a 50 or a 35. And then I, I'd try to remember that for the next day. Because, you know, I, 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 I guarantee it. Like, I probably looked super, super inexperienced with the crew. Um, you know, had an, an, had an ambition that I wanted to achieve with the film, but no real experience of doing a film of this scale before. So it was a real learning curve, this one was. Um, it was brutal, but yeah. But how, was, how did you do that shot? Was it one of these fig rig things? Or you said it was a jib? I, that, one, that one wasn't a fig. I'm pretty sure that was on a, on a Jimmy jib. It was sort of like, I wanted it to feel like the sort of, you know, when you get those body cam shots where they're attached to the yeah, actor. Yeah, because that's what it, I thought it was at first. And I was like, yeah. I'm not sure. But, but and that was the thing. The challenge was to kind of rise with him at the same time, but then ha but not for it to feel like a gimmick, you know, not for it to, because I'll be honest, sometimes when I see the body cam stuff or like a POV shot in an action sequence, I always find it draws too much attention to itself as a, as a, as a gimmick, as a setup. Um, and so when we did that shot of Eco getting up off the floor, I, I didn't want something that would take the audience out. So I knew I wanted to glide up with him and feel like we're anchored to him. But there's enough flexibility there and enough sort of like, you know, waviness in there so that when we do detach from him, you're, 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 you're sort of back in to your, your traditional narrative way of filming it then. This shot here, when he jumps over, this one there. Lovely that end. the start of that that one coming over with him, we were trying to rip off the the, the shot from one of the Bourne films. Like it was, I it wasn't supremacy or ultimate oh, supremacy. Oh, I think it was through the window. window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, but we couldn't follow that far because we we didn't have the sort of the the same kind of rig. Um, so we had a crane that just went as far as it could go over the edge before we had to sort of call cut and or you know cut in the shot then. Yeah, well, that um, bit born, uh, one of the stuntmen jumps off the roof with him. He was on a wire. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, this, how did this... that shot with the guy falling off? I mean, it's a great directorial touch there. The guy he hits him with a stick and then he falls down and hits the floor. How did you do that? Um, the, the, the gag with the pole going through his chest. Yeah. So um, I remember we, we knew that we would get so far with that shot. So we had, we had the guy on a wire. We had a pullback system so that he would jump so far and then get sort of pulled back. So it would like mimic the idea of him being like hit with something. So yeah. Eco had like a big sort of bamboo with a massive soft noodle rubber thing on the end of it, you know? So it was like one of those, like it, was, it would have just like folded and everything else, you know? So he was, he was kind of coming towards him with that and then hitting him with that thing. And then it would be like that, the moment of impact, they would yank him back to so be bump and then like this. And then, um, and then when we did the one following down with him, we literally yeah. set up two cranes then, and we had the we had Matt. Um, I think Matt did it, or maybe Dimas did it, where he was kind of on a wire as well. We both suspended. We suspended the, the, the two actors. The, the, there's a stunt performer, and then Dimas, and then we kind of we had them in tandem drop down to the to the sort of the ground below, which is obviously a load of boxes with a fake floor and rubber and everything else for the guy to land on. Um, and so, you know, probably, I think we probably would have done quite a lot of sort of like speed ramping in the fall, 
because there was just no way to kind of get that done in camera or for obvious reasons. Um, cause it was, it wasn't just about dropping a guy onto boxes or something. It was. What, so what did he land on? Cause hmm? it looks like one shot he hits the floor. Um, yeah, he's landing on, I think it's like boxes and a rubber mat or something like that. And then we just dusted it and then put oh, right. some it fake rubble down. Like a concrete floor. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't think it was a concrete floor. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he, 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 he hits that then. And, and, um, and, and basically, yeah, we just did that. We just did a whole thing. It was a very controlled thing. It was just like, it was like a pulley system where, cause we needed them to be both in sync with each other. And that was the hard part was getting them to both go and then yeah. and land at the same time. Morantau, compared to the raid, what mm. stands out to me in the way you shoot in the fights, um, it's, it's, it's got a similar feel, uh, handheld. Mm. By the time you went to do the raid, the handheld became even more prevalent. And yeah, like, you know, okay, so we've got the born uh, sort of shaky cam stuff where you can't see anything of what's going on. But it's like you took that sort of template of the erratic handheld, um, very kinetic feel but you're, you're doing it in a way that we can see everything that needs to be seen. Yeah. Is there some sort of shutter speed that you're playing with as well? Um, like I think so. I think, I think Matt would be the best person to kind of answer that one. Um, when we, we think we did shoot a higher, higher shutter speed for, for making sure we had you know, the detail and it'd be tight, you know, more crisp in terms of the focus and stuff, like more sharp following the movement of the action so we wouldn't smear across the screen because we knew we'd have a bit more movement. I think the main difference between why Maranto and why the raid feel so different in terms of that energy level is because when we were doing Maranto, we weren't shooting on, on sort of like proper, what you'd expect cameras for film, for making a feature film of that nature. We were shooting on the big broadcast cameras that the, of the old P2 card stuff, right? Which was like the Panasonic the P2. Big, big cameras. It was like the shoulder rig ones that you get for like broadcast you know, for, for news anchors and stuff like that, you know, that kind of thing, not for running around with an action thing. We were sticking that thing on a steady cam. And, um, you know, we, we did a lot of steady cam on, on Maranto. That's why it kind of floats and glides. And that's why, to be honest, when I watch it now, it's like some of that stuff, like especially that fight done by the bamboo scaffolding. Like mm -hmm. that's like, I mean, like that one, Maranto specifically for the first two thirds of the film is more influenced by Jackie's work. So like those fights, that fight with the little construction site with the, the bamboo scaffolding, it's playful. It's knockabout. And it's like, oh, we're going to show you this loop of rope because that's going to get used now. And we're going to feed a hand through it. We're going to tighten him up and tie him to that. Uh, you know, there's going to be a little thing that gets thrown into the face. He's going to get scooped up and bounce off the, uh, the, the wheelbarrow. And that wheelbarrow gag was something that we ripped wholesale off from Police Story 2. So there's the scene in Police Story 2 when he rushes in, pop, 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 punches the guy and the guy's body, hits a wheelbarrow on the way down to the ground. And yeah. I was like, oh, we should do that. We should definitely do that. <laughs> and, um, and so it's more playful. And then as the film progresses and as the, the tone of the story gets more serious, so does the action. It becomes more brutal and more violent than in, in Maranto. I, I, actually, you know, I got to give a shout out to Mike Leader because when he saw Maranto, he was like, there was loads to admire to it. But he was like, I think you might be burning your actors out by doing too many long takes on Steadicam. Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, I think you're right because we, you know, so the guys were I exhausted. Isaac about that as well. <laughs> yeah, hook them up. <laughs> and, um, and so when it came to the raid then, not only was I, you know, mindful of what Mike had told me in terms of that idea of like breaking the action down into like slightly smaller pieces and then being more specific with it. But um, I had been watching... Um, religiously this music video by Roman Gavras born free the MIA song born free mm -hmm. um and um there's a there's an amazing there's an amazing music video but it's all about sort of like you know a SWAT team rounding up a bunch of kids with ginger hair and stuff like that and all that da, da, da. it's like talking about race relations stuff like that in America and basically when I watched that music video it's got tons of energy going on and it's like it's breakneck the pace is fast but it's got this like semi-documentary style feel to it where you're, you're bundling long over the shoulders of these SWAT team members. And I just remember saying to Matt, this is the feel of the raid. This is what we should be trying to achieve with the raid. We should be with them over their shoulder. And then as everything kicks off, we stay in their perspective. We stay anchored with them as much as possible. And so um, 
it lent itself to a thing where I felt like if we're going to shoot the drama in this way of them storming that building and going in floor by floor, and then, you know, we're going to have that sort of uh, discipline in terms of how we're going to shoot the drama elements, then if the action suddenly becomes smooth, steady cam shots that are just curving around beautifully choreographed action, it won't match up. It'll be totally two different things. Um, and I knew this would be a bit more grubby and a bit more grimy. And it just felt like, you know what? I think the, the way we shoot action should reflect that. It should be a continuation of a style so that it doesn't feel like you've got two different films sandwiched together. Um, mm. And so, so that, that lent itself to a slightly more handheld style, but also what allowed us to go handheld, because obviously if we were still using the, those big broadcast cameras, we'd have no chance of doing that. But um, Panasonic had released the new camera then, which is the AF100. We were still in the early days of red back then. So we weren't, the, what, the red scarlet was being talked about, but hadn't yet come out when we did the raid one. If it had come out, we would have shot with the red scarlet because that was the one we, were, we had eyes on. And we were like a smaller version of the red, is it? Smaller, slightly smaller version than the red. Yeah, still heavy, but like smaller and more compact. Yeah. And so back then it was anyway. And so, you know, we were like, right, we're going to have to, we have to use the, we do, well, we didn't have to. We wanted to use the AF100 because it was the best thing that we could at that time for that kind of compactness. And so we, um, we did a Frankenstein's monster of that camera um, where we recorded out onto external recording to get 422 color. Um, and then we had the, all the bells and whistles on it. And then basically what we started using on that film was the fig rig. Fig so, rig. yeah, which Mike Figgis invented great. for time code, I think, because he just wanted his DPs. He had a four, four DV cameras recording at once and he didn't want it to all feel like literally handheld, you know. Yeah. Uh, in the palm of the hand and then it allowed them the flexibility to shoot using these steering wheel rigs and um, we, we Which allowed we, you to do crazy stuff like going through the floor like turning it like this in a fight turning it like this you've got grip handles all over the place then so you can grip hold of it you can pass it from one DP to another DP yeah. um, you can come down really low from the ground and then swing up and be high within, this, within the, all, the, all the time it takes for you to lift your arms so it allowed you to reset quite a lot throughout the space. And, and for us, it, it, was a, it was a revelation. So mostly using quite a wide lens. So you're quite close to the action or? or yeah, what? quite, quite, quite often. I mean, like, unless we're doing a specific insert where we want that detail, then we'll swing up to a, a, you know, a tighter lens, like a 35 maybe or something. But nine times out of 10, we, we're, we're hovering between 12 and 20. You know, we never really go in like, you know, we never go in. We don't go wider than 12 because it just starts getting cartoonish and everyone starts stretching at the sides. Um, but 12 to 14 is kind of our go-to. All right, so this fight, this is another example of being stuck inside the small sort of like corridor space and, and having to sort of, yeah, here you go. Look, see, we're in line with the door. <laughs> that was what I was talking about earlier. So in that shot in particular, we were literally in line with the door in order to get the width of that shot. Um, we knew with this fight scene, I mean, we wanted to feel breakneck and sort of crazy place. That was one of those Dutch tilts that we That's did with brilliant. the camera as well. Um, we did have a, we did, we were talking earlier about body cam stuff and POV stuff, right? And um, we did have a plan on one of the shots there. You know when the guy leaps towards him and jumps on him and he, they crash to the floor? Yeah. We did uh, at that point sort of have, a, have, a, have an idea in mind of, of having a body camera attached to the back of him and to follow him on that leap. Right. Um, but um, Matt Flannery, who's always right with these things, was like, dude, don't do that. It's too gimmicky. It's going to break you out of there, and it's going to feel forced. Um, let's, just, let's just try to follow him and have that handheld feel over his shoulder. Yeah, I think I can get that. I think I can, if I jump off an apple box, I'll follow him on the jump. Um, and and it was, it was, he was right. He was totally right, because the, 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 the gimmick didn't really work then. You seem to punctuate fights with extreme moments of violence. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we, we cheesily refer to them as punchlines when we're designing the, the, the fight scenes where I feel like every fight should kind of, like, every good fight should have like four or five good punchlines, like good moments within the choreography where you get the audience to do a collective gasp or something. You know? And um, one of the things I've, I've learned doing this stuff and 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 you know christ feels like such a lifetime ago now watching films in the cinema with people is um the the communal aspect of a fight sequence when it plays out when 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 one of those punch lines lands and it lands hard the audience get a real kick out of it because it it creates 
a weird sense of levity within the scene so that when you see something so outrageous and the other thing i'd say is that when when we do hit you with these pockets of like strong violence they're not prolonged so that you know it's like you get a glimpse of something you get like a little bit of detail enough to kind of like to fill that part of your brain with it and then we whip and cut away and we go sh- show you something else now and then the next build up to what the next punchline will be further down the line um and, and it's just so much fun to kind of like to do those sequences and to kind of like to to hear the audience sort of like erupt into laughter because they realize that you know if you're sat in a room of 200 300 people and then at the exact same moment all of you have gone <gasps> like that yeah. it suddenly becomes absurd and it becomes funny and it becomes silly and and you can kind of like enjoy the moment of it then so that when when the fight is over the idea is that you've give, you've taken them on that journey where the adrenaline is kicking up and up and up and up throughout the entire fight sequence so that by the end of it when it settles and like quite a lot of the fights i do sort of end the same way where it's like it suddenly goes quiet you know so you're you're in this high energy high stakes sequence and then it just it drops so in that moment that's when you get those moments where the audience and are all hearing each other kind of catch their breath and then they realize oh we've just been on this roller coaster ride just breaks out laughing because yeah you don't know what else to do it's 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 shocking obviously when we're shooting martial arts uh the one thing that i'm i'm fully aware of and it's one of the hardest things to kind of for me to wrap my head around is the fact that when you shoot it, it's piece by piece, it's shot by shot. And, I, and I'm guessing like, it's like you, you're not, you're not doing sort of like, you know, long coverage of the entire sequence from one angle. I mean, we, I guess you, your, your experience has been similar to what we do as well, which is jigsaw pieces of, of, of the, of the fight sequence unfolding. Right. Yeah. And um, when you do that, the one thing I've always kind of found interesting and fascinating is how, how you guys as performers maintain a sense of understanding of where your head is at during that fight. Because, you know, each fight tells a story. Every fight has a little bit of a journey and the characters go on those journeys too. And so, you know, it's that idea of like, whether it's purely down to like showing the idea of, okay, this is where I'm more fatigued or this is a part of the fight where I'm desperately trying to get the upper hand or, you know, know, all of those things is because people don't, what people don't realize when they just watch martial arts films is that all of those things are shot over like, you know, consecutive days in sometimes five to 10 second chunks. And so to to have that sort of like that flow, that through flow of continuity in terms of a performance that takes you from the beginning of the fight to the end of the fight, it's a challenge. And so like what goes on in your head then when you're, when you're, when you're doing scenes like that? I think you've got to make those decisions in the rehearsal process and just try not to forget it on the day. Yeah. yeah. Mental notes. Oh, this is the bit where I want to, or maybe I've got an idea for a line that I might want to say here, or this is like the, where the, you know, the, the axis tilts in in the fight and and I get the upper hand. Yeah. And to just remember to be tired as well, because we are tired all the time. Yeah. Um, Because you're doing it so much. But, you know, as soon as I say action, you you know, you go into it and you do it. um, And yeah, you definitely need to make a mental note of no, normal, real people can't fight for this long (laughs) without without getting tired. So that's something I try to do these days, which I probably didn't do in the past. But then again, it depends on the tone of the movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, But I think you just got to make that decision in the rehearsal process and, and just try not to forget when you're absolutely shattered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not like you could, it's not like you've got a script of the fight, is it? It's yeah. kind of in your head. Well, yeah, it's all part of the design process, isn't it? Yeah. And then... Yeah. Was it uh, Jackie Chan said something like, um, is make, making action films is much harder because you've got to do all the action and then you've got to act. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean, so... There are some directors that come along and they shoot something in a certain way that's so impactful that it then becomes that you have to copy what that director has done. So when I think of John Woo, it's like everyone did the two guns in the slow motion mm. on the doves. Maybe not the doves, but you know, they tried to John Woo it up. And then Michael Mann came along with Heat and he did what he did. And it was like, okay, that's the way to shoot a gunfight now. Make it real, make the, the bullets sound like they're actually yeah. going through buildings. Um, 
Chad Stahelski with John Wick. You know, mm -hmm. people want to copy that style. When you came out with the raid and the way you shot the fights, people want to copy that style because it was just something that, you know, we kind of seen it all before, but it was, it was new enough that it was something different. The way you're moving the camera, it's got a lot in common with Saving Private Ryan, from, from, as far as I could tell. It seems like it's a higher shutter speed. It's a very dynamic camera. But what's most important and where people, a lot of people go wrong is you can always see the action and mm. you always understand the geography of the set and where everyone is and where the kicks are coming from and it's not over edited it's nice to kind of hear that about the 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 fact that it's still got clarity because quite often you see people might be like um, i remember somebody criticizing the raid 2 saying oh there's too much shaky cam that our framing's all off no. and then it's like and I, i'm like i'm like you know there's clarity there like and there's energy to them I, I agree there's energy to the shots you know mm -hmm. i mean and i think that's the difference of it because there's there's a certain style of like chaos cinema where it's just, it's crazy. It's like 15 cuts in like every sort of like three or four seconds and it's all close ups. You're not really seeing the detail. Yeah. I think when what we do is what we try to do at least is, is maintain that sense of geographical space so that you're not lost in the movement of something. You're not sort of trying to figure out where am I in the room right now? You always want to know exactly where you are and you know where the attacks are coming from. You know how well, the, the relationship of that action is with the space that you're in. And so I've always felt like, yeah, we, we definitely bring energy there, but I, I would sort of like, that's the thing on my counter would be that it's not, it's not purely like shaky cam represents a, a style of filmmaking. That's probably different from what I'm aiming for, if that makes sense, because I want you to follow it. I want you to, yeah. to see the detail of it. <laughs> This shot we hear, by the way, I'm pretty sure we did a quite a long take with Baseball Batman. I gotta remind myself of this, hold on. Yeah, because there's three people there, yeah. So I remember when we shot this, like Very, by the way, who plays Baseball Batman, he is amazing. Like he was um, he was a member of Eco's- uh, That kills uh, me, that one, on the top yeah. of the Well, that, 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 I'll, I'll give credit to that. That was um, referencing Violent Cop, the Takeshi Kitano film. There's an amazing bit in there where it's like a slow-mo sequence and the guy just gets bong hit on the top of the head and it always went through me like it, i'm quite squeamish in real life weirdly oh um, how can you be squeamish look at what we're <laughs> yeah i know but this is a sick man but this is just this is just condoms of fake blood <laughs> you know what i mean um yeah. we did we did loads of practical effects in this thing like every time you see the blood spilling it's a it's a condom that's being strapped to that person's body with um, where we kind of like we took all the sort of the all the sort of lubricant off it so they were dry, filled them with blood, um, stuck some tape on with um, super glue, and then we'd attach that to the weapons. So then on those shots, if we knew we knew we'd go like in, and then I knew my cut point was her pulling out the hammer. Right. So then when in the next shot, then we'd have the the hammer with a little bit of string attached to the condom with the tape on it, and then three, two, one, pull. And then the timing would be perfect. You just get this explosion of like fake blood going everywhere. That Practical one is always, always the best. best. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like it, uh, when you got time, it works perfectly. The problem we got nowadays is that we have we feel like we have so little time to kind of execute these things. That do we really want to do the practical? Could we not do the CG version? It's like yeah, yeah. the CG version can look good. Bitch, when you've got to clean up the blood, it's a nightmare, isn't it? And and I think I think what we tend to do now is we will do. Uh, a couple of takes of the clean version without any practical effects to make sure that we've got the shot. And then we do oh, yeah. the, a take with the practical effects and we do one more take with, with the actual practical effects. So that if we, you know, by that time, like the first few takes, you valued out the, the, the creases of, oh, that shot didn't go right or the, the timing was off or the reaction wasn't right. And then you got the reaction right then on a clean version. And then the next one is like, let's replicate that but now with actual practical effects. And then, you know, you get the best of both worlds. And if the shot works well on the practical, great. If not, you've got reference for the VFX to use, which is in camera. This was, um, this was a very, very, very cold field in Kent um, in December. Uh, I still haven't fully got the feeling back in two of my toes. It was just ice cold there. It was unreal. Um, you know, mud up to our, our shins and stuff like that. It was insane. Um, but yeah, we did, we did some, you know, this was like one of those experiences.
Yeah, hardboard, very much. Shot. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we knew we wanted to scramble a bike, and then uh, Ray nicked them with the shotgun as well, um, and Joel on the bike. Um, you know, and we 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 did like some, we did some pretty intensive stuff here. Um, you know, Dave Judge was our guy for the rigging, so he did all sort of the wire work of the bungee onto onto Joel, who got yanked off the back of the bike, um, and then uh, about to pop out through this window is um, Andy Taylor. He was like part of our stunt team as well. Um, you know, he was part of the design aspect of it. He also did the guy burning with the petrol bomb as well when in, in the middle of the thing. I mean, like me and Jude uh, uh, and the team, when we were designing this sequence, like we, you know, it's that weird thing of being in a, we were, I think we were in like an air, aircraft hangar or no, we were in the big, we were in the studio. We booked the studio out at three mills. Um, so we could, so we could build like the cardboard boxes of the caravans and get a rough sense of placement and, and positioning um, in order to do the, the previs again, um, in order to figure out exactly how we were going to shoot this thing. And it was a pretty ambitious shoot. You did a phenomenal job, uh, the whole of Gangs of London. Hmm. I've never seen action of that quality in any TV series ever. I've never seen action of that quality close to ever it is absolutely incredible and i just want to say to people if anyone wants to learn how to shoot how to film a gunfight for my money that is the way to do it there is something to be said about seeing the gun shoot and whatever is getting hit get hit in the same shot and it is the yeah. same process as filming a fight you want to see the guy throw the punch and the other guy get hit by the punch in one shot and when you can do that like you do or john woo does that's the gravy. That's what makes but, it great. No, I, I agree completely. It's like, cause I, I, I hate, I hated the idea of doing like the, my, my least favorite shots across anything that we do is when it's like, Oh, it's a, it's a guy shooting a gun past camera and then another shot of somebody else reacting to it. I hate those moments. Like they, they bother me more. Um, you need, and, them. And I, you need them, but yeah, you need them. Of course you do. Best. But that, but that's the thing. It's like, it's when you see, like for me, it's like, when we get when we're in the the loft in in episode five and, and Mal is going crazy and he has his little heroic bloodshed moment and he's like shooting the hell out of Andy and then dives around the corner and shoots Craig in the legs and, stuff, and then they drop and face each other and then they're like shooting at each other from point blank range and stuff that's that amazing. it all just feels more visceral it feels more real and it feels it's it's just got a ton of energy and it's the same way that we would do from like martial arts then as well but it's like but with gunplay. And I think that's, those are my favorite moments within them because it's just more immediate then, I think. Yeah, it's the same concept, isn't it? It works for gunfights and, and for fights. Just mm. cause and effect in the same shot. That's when yeah, it's happens. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Gareth Evans, thank you so much, mate. It's a pleasure talking to you. And I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you, man. Pre appreciate it so much. It's been such fun to kind of like just chat about it, you know, and, 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 you know, and obviously I, you know, I've been a fan of your work as well and stuff like that. So it's like, it's always exciting to see, like for me, it's like, it's always a process of just learning from other people, what other people are doing too, you know, I, I, you learn from each other. We, we, you know, it's, it's like, it's like a shared community of, of, of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. So it's like, you know, when, when, when you guys are putting films out, when, when George Miller did like Mad Max or Free Road and stuff like that, um, and, and with the guys that were doing John Wick with Chad and, and, and David as well, when they, when you're all, when all, when we're all kind of like pushing to try and find what the next cool thing is, or the next sort of like the, the next thing that's going to be like, Oh man, that was incredible. Like we're all watching each other's stuff. We're all, we're all sort of learning from each other and all kind of like analyzing each other's work. So I just feel like it's a, it's a great community and a great sort of like opportunity to keep pushing the discipline and, and keep pushing it as an art form. I think. I think, you know, like we were talking earlier with the stunts thing, it's something like a, it's something you feel like should get rewarded at some point. I feel like the fact that there's no stunt, uh, stunt coordinator awarded the Oscars is, is insane. Um, because the, the level of professional that needs to go into these things is, 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 is astounding. So I just love being able to be in a situation now where I get to talk to people like yourselves. I get to talk to and, and, and learn from other people and, and, and take that on board and put it into my own work as well. So it's a, yeah, it's a great old experience, isn't it? Wouldn't Thanks. want to do anything else. Thanks for giving us some of your time, mate, to uh, educate us about the art of action. <laughs>